Good evening, everybody, and, uh, and thank you for joining us at this, the second lecture of our special 50th anniversary inaugural lecture series. And what an anniversary year it's turning out to be. Um, I'm Liz Marr, Interim Co-Vice-Chancellor for Students here at the Open University, and very proud and privileged to be hosting one of the university's 50th anniversary celebrations, events which showcase our research and teaching. Each year, the Vice-Chancellor invites newly appointed and promoted professors to give an inaugural lecture. Over the course of a year, our inaugural lecture series provides an opportunity to celebrate academic excellence, with each lecture representing a significant milestone in an academic's career. This evening, we'll hear from Professor Martin Weller, Professor of Educational Technology, who will challenge us to think about what the term open means. The Open University has become in many ways a household name over the past 50 years, and as with many familiar terms, we often don't stop to ask ourselves what exactly they mean to us. He will challenge us even further by asking if we were to open an, uh, invent an Open University now, what would it look like? We at the OU have been engaged in research on education since our inception in 1969. Since then, we've progressed from producing late-night BBC programmes to online teaching and online laboratories. So Martin Weller's talk on openness is more relevant than ever this year. But before Martin takes us on that journey, some housekeeping. Um, the lecture will be followed by a Q&A session, and then we invite you to celebrate with us downstairs. For anyone in the audience using Twitter, please feel free to tweet using the hashtag displayed and tagging at Open University, and let the world join us this evening. For members of our audience joining us via live stream, please use the email address provided, and keep your comments and questions brief so that we can address them during the Q&A. <coughs> and now some background about Martin Weller. Um, Martin is Professor of Educational Technology here at the Open University, and his interest has always been in the application of new technology to academic practice. He leads the Open Educational Resources, OER hub, research team, running a portfolio of projects examining the impact of open educational practices. He joined the OU in 1995 as a lecturer in artificial intelligence. He went on to chair the OU's first major e-learning course, You, Your Computer and the Net, in 1999 with nearly 15,000 students. This involved a number of strategic shifts to move the OU to become an online as well as distance provider. He was the first director of the virtual learning environment, recommending the adoption of Moodle, a free and open source learning management system. He's currently academic director for the Learning Design Project and director of the OER Hub. His research area is in open education and digital scholarship. He blogs about this and has authored two books, The Digital Scholar and The Battle for Open, both available under open license. He's a regular and well-known blogger at edtechie.net and is the OU academic with the most followers on Twitter, topping the scales at 9,760. If anybody wants to try and beat that, just let us know. Um, if you want to tag Martin in your tweets, his Twitter handle is um, at mweller. So, it now gives me great pleasure to introduce Professor Martin Weller. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, so, hi everyone. Thanks for coming out on a cold February night to Milton Keynes and all those people joining online. Uh, thank you for coming in. Uh, so, as Liz said, please join in the, the conversation with the, the hashtag. Um, and warning, it's going to get a bit interactive. You know, I apologise. but We're not doing jazzercise or anything, but... Um, I'll be using some polls, so if you've got a mobile device or laptop, you can go to that link, uh, and when the polls become active, they'll come up there, and you can uh, partake and join in the, the conversation. Uh, don't worry, the, 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 the link comes up on each of the polls anyway, so you don't have to have it in there now. Um, so, as Liz said, this is my inaugural lecture, um, but I shouldn't really be here, because I actually became a professor about 15 years ago. Uh, but at the time, there was a backlog, and I kind of got forgotten. But I like to think the talk I'm giving tonight is better than the one I would have given 15 years ago. <laughs> so if you don't like tonight's talk, just you know, console yourself with how much you wouldn't have liked it 15 years ago. Uh, but also, as a comprehensive, educated, uh, working-class lad, working in higher education, 
Uh, I'm no stranger to imposter syndrome, so uh, you know uh, tonight either marks the kind of the, the peak of that or its final resolution. We'll see. Um, so just in the interest of seeing whether this, this interactive stuff works, and as an example of openness, so if you go there, you should be able to click on the map and say where you're coming in from. So I know we've got a few people, my friends and colleagues from different places watching online. Uh, we should be able to see where they're coming in from. I expect it will be quite a high density around Milton Keynes, but you know, let's let's see if we've got anyone coming in from Antarctica or anything. Okay, so we've got one in America, a couple of in Canada. That's that far one in Canada. That might be Clint along. If it's Clint, hi Clint. Um, on some South America, good. Uh, I don't believe the person in Antarctica, but let's go. With it. That's great. That's great. So thank you much, uh, everyone who's coming in and watching online, and people here. Um, so my talk tonight is really trying to answer this question: What does the open in open university mean? Um, and I want to try and explore that evolving nature and definition of what open education is. And that's Jenny Lee, who um, is the arts minister when the Open University was founded and uh, wrote the, the uh, portfolio for us to go into existence. Um, and also to try and think about what could open what could open education mean or what should it mean. And I was prompted by this, but I was at a, a conference in the US uh, recently and I was talking about the Open University and open education. And someone came up to me afterwards and said, do you know what, it's never occurred to me before that it's the open university. Um, and I kind of know what they mean, because we often just say it as one word, it's the open university. But openness is kind of core to our very identity, it's kind of in our DNA. So I want to explore what that openness means. So, uh, what does the open in open university mean to you? Keep it clean, people. Okay, so we're getting words like accessible, open, uh, open entry, uh, barriers, inclusive. So I think um, the kind of message coming up there is, is it this idea of removal of barriers to education, o open up education for people, um, which is no surprise. That, that's what we're there for. Very good, very nice. I'll, I'll move on. Thank you. Um, so this is our charter. Um, now, open um, university mission statements are actually, generally, when you look at them, really quite bland and, and interchangeable. You know, it's like they're about achieving excellence, everyone reaching their potential, that kind of stuff. Uh, but the open university's mission statement is almost like a, a work of poetry. It kind of, it's applicable now as it was then, and each element of it is really important. So open to people meant we removed uh, entry barriers for people to come and study with us. Open to places meant that we uh, allowed people to study at a distance. Open to methods allowed us to... Uh, do distance education, use new technologies and those kind of things. And lastly, open to ideas, um, which is what I want to explore tonight, particularly around uh, open, uh, what open education means. So kind of prior to the 1990s, before the internet, um, open education more or less meant the model that we had defined. It meant what open universities were. There were some other definitions, but um, it was largely our definition. Uh, so but an alternative title for this talk could be Me, the OU and Open. Uh, as Liz said, I joined uh, uh, in 1995, and at my interview, I, I stupidly said, have you thought about using the web for teaching? Uh, and they took that to be a deep knowledge of the web and the internet, and, uh, which wasn't quite true, but I got the job anyway. Um, and it, it's interesting, because um, at the time, sort of my, my career at the OU almost also matches the, the kind of internet years of the Open University. And I want to kind of explore the, the intersection of these three things. My, my own experience, the OU, and open education. Um, and the reason it's interesting is because in around 95, um, Tim Berners-Lee and, and the web was becoming popular, built on, on the internet. Uh, and the point of that is that these were open technologies. Anyone could publish anything, so there was no central control. So you've got these very open technologies, uh, removing filter for publication, uh, and how that affects an open education system. So the two things are going to come together, I think. Uh, so I want to talk through a number of projects, really, that kind of demonstrate that change in evolution of, of openness. So um, was something we explored, and uh, John Norton, he's here tonight, uh, led this project called the Open Source Teaching Project. 
And the idea there was, can we take the ideas of the open source software community and apply them to teaching? So in open source software, you can take bits of code and other people can take them, adapt them and reuse them and put them into a new bit of, a new, new bit of software. So we came up with this idea of having discrete kind of learning objects, discrete bits of teaching content that you would then put into an online repository. Um, does this work? And then you'd be able to reversion those in someone, someone else would come along and reversion them into a new course. Uh, and we didn't really follow this through as much as we could have done, I think, which was a shame. Because at the time, lots of other people, is one of those ideas that other people were, were coming to simultaneously. So uh, in the US, uh, David Wiley, for instance, was coming to the same idea, looking at some of the ideas around licenses. And it's from this kind of work that uh, Creative Commons licenses grew. So here we're beginning to think about different ways of creating courses of teaching because of openness. Uh, as Liz said, uh, I chaired uh, our first large on -scale, uh, large scale online course called T171. Uh, this is a graphic from that course I managed to find somewhere. Uh, it looked really cool back in the day. This is in 1999. Um, and I remember at the time, a, an academic colleague here saying to me, no one wants to learn that way. You'll be lucky to get 50 students on that course. And of course, we got 15,000 students on the course. And it turns out lots of people wanted to learn that way. And what was significant about that was it demonstrated that we could take the Open University's supported open learning model and adapt it to online provision, which we weren't sure we could do before then. So we had something like 600 tutors operating only online uh, tuition. There was no printed units. All the students submitted their assignments as HTML pages. Um, I still remember fondly. So the, the pages would be unwrapped into a website which you had to mark. And this was back in 99 when things like GeoCities were popular. Someone had had scrolling text for a tiny window that you had to click on to get into their assignment. So it was kind of quite creative. Um, and I had a kind of epiphany moment. I was sitting in a production meeting early on in the, in the production of this course. Um, and I explained to them, we're going to have no printed units. Nothing's going to be sent out. It's all going to be online. And about half of the room stood up and walked out because there were people who were involved in the warehouse, involved in printed units and that. And that kind of made me realise how much of the OU was built around delivering physical stuff and how much of going digital was a real challenge to that. Um, but it was very successful and uh, it sort of led to a lot of cultural change in the OU. Uh, so this kind of demonstrated that the OU could, could shift itself online. And as I say, we had a lot of students in that, 15,000. So I hope you'll permit me a slight kind of eye roll when MOOCs, Massive Open Online Courses, come along in 2012 and claim to have invented large-scale online learning. Um, and then in a, uh, a couple of years later, I became the uh, OU's first VLE Director, Virtual Learning Environment. And at the time, we kind of had lots of different packages around the OU. We had uh, some in-house systems, some third-party systems, some bits and bobs for creating websites, for communication, for doing various bits and pieces. And we wanted kind of one universal enterprise system across the university. Um, and I, I did a big kind of stakeholder analysis, talking to people. Uh, and the thing I proposed at the time was what we called a service-oriented architecture. The idea was that you could plug in kind of best of breed things into one, one kind of motherboard and have this, this enterprise system. Um, and then Ross McKenzie, who came after me as the VLO, VLE director, who actually did all the hard work, uh, implemented Moodle. And the good thing about Moodle was that, because it's open source, we could take it and adapt it and make it suit our needs. A lot of the kind of out-of-the-box VLE didn't really suit us as a large-scale um, institution. And we're the, the largest uh, contributor to the uh, Moodle code base. Um, so here we've got openness as the means of creating a large e-learning platform for thousands and thousands of students. And then around 2006, I was part of a project led by uh, Tony Walton. And we got funding from uh, the Hewlett Foundation to set up OpenLearn. So OpenLearn was our way of creating open educational resources. These are resources that are freely available online uh, with a, an open license anyone can take, use and adapt. Uh, and around 2001, 2002, uh, MIT in the States uh, had started off the uh, OER movement. And when they said, we're going to give away all of our content, um, our course content, freely online. And at the time, that was a real kind of revelation because the received wisdom was that content is king. You, you kind of keep your content, don't let anyone have it. And they just said, we're going to give it away. Uh, but actually, it turned out that um, a lot of MIT content doesn't make much sense outside of the context of MIT, whereas OU content is designed to be studied uh, online. Um, so we got funding from uh, Hewlett Foundation. 
uh, and Andy Lane and then uh, uh, Andrew Law took on the Open Loan platform. Uh, it's been a huge success. We have 10 million a year, is that? Visitors a year, is that right, Andrew? Eight, okay, let's, let's go with eight, eight million. So, and lots of those then go on to study with the OU. Uh, as other OER forums have closed uh, around the country, it's now the biggest OER repository in the UK. Um, a big kind of success. So here, openness is allowing the OU to explore our kind of public engagement mission, public teaching mission. There's a new way of doing that. So just to kind of stop and recap for a bit, so we get to the end of the late 2000s, We've got a large-scale open-source VLE supporting thousands of students. We've got a large OER repository, which live in large-scale online courses. Uh, all of our courses have a digital platform. We implemented an e-learning policy that said all courses need to have some online element, and providing a range of free digital content across different platforms, such as YouTube. Now, that looks like quite a digital transformed university to me. Uh, and the reason I mention that is that I sometimes wonder if we didn't do a, a good enough job at this stage of telling our story. Uh, so again, last year when we were going through some of our troubles, the kind of often, the perception you often heard in the pub press was, the OU needs to get digital. And I said, we've been digital for a long time and I found it very confusing. So I'll, I'll come back to this. I think it's about kind of the story we tell about ourselves. Um, then about 2006, uh, late 2000s, I kind of took a turn away from more institutional projects to more kind of in thinking about the individual, particularly with the rise of uh, what we used to call Web 2.0, and started blogging. So I recently passed my, did my 1,000th blog post um, over 12, 13 years. So not prolific, but, you know, steady. It gets there. Um, and I get about 2 million visits a year on that blog, so it kind of has quite an impact. And I think it's been really important for me um, to kind of develop a student, uh, develop an academic identity. Uh, and it's, it's also allowed me to kind of make lots of connections around the world. I often say that becoming a blogger was the best kind of academic decision I ever made. And I think, again, last year when we were going through some of that, uh, those more trying times, I think social media and blogging allowed a lot of the OU community to kind of come together and, and have a voice and feel like they could make a connection with other people. Um, and through blogs, I got to meet people such as uh, George Seamus and Stephen Downs, who are often attributed as being the, uh, the, the founders of, of MOOCs, Massive Open Online Courses. Um, and we experimented with those. So I think uh, George and I ran a, um, a MOOC about the future of the course online, and I contributed to some of their very experimental early MOOCs. And then in 2012, Martin Bean set up uh, FutureLearn uh, as a separate company, as we know, and I was part of the team that advised that. Um, we also experimented in-house, so uh, we ran a master's course and I opened up my block, which was about open education, as an open block, so the formal students got to study alongside informal students who could study it as, as a MOOC. Uh, in, in Open Learn, we developed badged open courses so students can study and they get a, a badge at the end of that. So here's the openness as the OU of exploring ways of giving out free learning and exploring what it means to, to take a course. Uh, then around 2012, um, we got funding from uh, the Hewlett Foundation to, to look at open educational resources. Um, there's a kind of open ed educational resources. No, no one really argues with them. Giving away free learning stuff is generally deemed to be a good thing. Um, but lots of people had kind of beliefs about them that they would state as, as fact. You know, like they save students money, they increase performance, that kind of stuff. So what we did with the OER Hub was um, come up with 11 hypotheses which kind of generally reflected those common beliefs that people had about OER. Um, and we developed a, an evidence hub, so we could then go out and try and find evidence to for either for or against each of these hypotheses. And as an aside, we developed the evidence hub as a, an open source platform, and it's then gone on to be used in uh, other projects which have nothing to do with OER, because it turns out that a, an evidence hub is a pretty good way to approach lots of research projects. So we went away and tried to find kind of evidence for and against OER. So this is us researching into open education. But as well as researching into open education, um, what we tried to develop was researching in the open, if you like, adopting research, uh, open research practice. So we did a number of things. So uh, we gave away all of our data openly. So we, we had the kind of biggest data set of um, OER survey question responses, something like 7,500, and we anonymized those and gave away all that data set so other researchers could play with them and combine them with their own research. Uh, we developed an open researcher pack that contained things like uh, ethics approval forms, um, 
survey questions, advice on how to conduct research so that other people could then go and conduct their own research. Um, we set up a number of open courses about how to become an open educational researcher. Um, and we, we make extensive use of social media, so the kind of the research project and team itself as an identity. And one project that I really love is uh, GoGN. So it's a global network of OER PhD researchers. Uh, and we get them together once a year, about 12 to 15 of them every year, at a conference and kind of help them talk through their research. And we also run monthly webinars and stuff. And for a lot of these researchers, kind of globally, they'll be the only person in their institution who's researching OER, open education. Um, even their supervisors may not know much about that kind of area. So uh, the GoGN is kind of a real support network for those. A lot of those people have gone on to do great work. Um, and also we try to get them to research in the open as well. So things like encouraging only publishing open access journals, those kind of things. Um, so open access publishing has been a real kind of success story in, in open education. The idea that um, all journal articles that are published are openly accessible to everybody. Uh, it's often seen as a kind of quite an, an ethical position if public funding is paying for that research and everyone should be able to access the outcome of it. Uh, around 2009, this is the one time I've been ahead of the curve fashion-wise. Uh, I said I'm only going to publish in open access journals um, and that's been my stance since. And, and, but since then we've kind of had things like the REF mandate as well that everything should be available open access at some point. Um, so with my colleague Anne Jones, I'm the co-editor of JIME, which is an open access journal. Um, and we've developed a model where we publish with a, a, a publisher, Ubiquity, uh, who are open access. And uh, through a generous grant from IET, we cover the, the small fee for each article, which allows us not to charge anything to the authors. Um, I've also published two books, soon to be three, I hope, uh, under an open access license, which is a really interesting uh, experience really because I've published two books kind of conventionally beforehand um, and as soon as you realize you know you're not going to be rich off writing academic textbooks you know th th they're not going to get you that yacht so uh, what you actually want is just them to be out there and when you make them open access kind of interesting things happen to them so um, I wrote a book called The Digital Scholar back in uh, 2011 uh, and someone says to me this is a really good kind of resource to use for staff development so what we did was uh, with OpenLearn team, we developed one of those badged open courses based on that book. And because it was open access, I could take lots of my own text and reuse it. Whereas the strange thing is, often when you write a book, the, the publisher owns the, the, the text of your, the copyright of your text. You can't reuse it. And similarly, I wrote a book called uh, The Battle for Open in 2014. Um, and I found out a couple of weeks ago that someone's taken that and put it all, the, all of it into Wiki so that students can then uh, add to it and uh, amend it and, and reuse it. And they don't need to ask my permission to do that because it's uh, openly licensed. Uh, so we're just finishing up a project uh, with the OER Hub team called uh, UK Open Textbooks. Uh, open textbooks are openly licensed textbooks. Um, so they come with usually a Creative Commons license. The digital version is free and the print version is kind of at cost. Uh, but also, crucially, because they're openly licensed, you can take them and adapt them. So you can say, I don't like chapter two in this book. Uh, I'm going to change it and do something different with it. Or I can make it more suitable to our particular local context. Um, now, open textbooks are a big thing in the US because the price of textbooks <laughs> um, is really prohibitive out there. So they, it was used as a way to kind of address that, the cost of textbooks. Uh, and they've been very successful things that, uh, through um, projects such as OpenStax. And what we wanted to do was see if that model from North America transferred to the UK. So we did a, a, a trial over here and we did workshops at a number of universities. We went to a number of big conferences to try and sort of push the idea of, of open textbooks. Uh, and what we found was that um, open textbooks, the, the cost isn't so much a driver here. Uh, there, are, there isn't such a big um, factor in students deciding not to have those textbooks. And the way we use textbooks is slightly differently. We tend not to have just one specific textbook, but rather a, a, a reading list. But in some ways, that makes the use of open textbooks even more likely, because people say, I might as well make one of those textbooks um, open. And, that, and I was quite surprised at how much of an appetite there was for open textbooks. So I think this is a kind of real area that, that, that's kind of ripe for um, development in the UK. And the OU would be well placed to, to explore and develop that, I think.
Uh, and lastly, uh, an area um, that you can loosely call open pedagogy, so using open practices in how you teach. Uh, we've begun to scratch the surface a bit of this in, in the Open University, so I was part of a, a course team called YXM 130, Making a Learning Count, which we loosely called the Open Box course, uh, led by Claire Turner. And um, the idea there is that students can bring in their own learning from elsewhere, so they can bring in their learning from OpenLearn on any subject, and then they demonstrate that how much they understand that knowledge by doing presentations and making links to other disciplines. And then they can get formal credit and move into the kind of formal OU system there. Um, on a, a master's course we've just completed, H880, it's going to be the first course delivered uh, through FutureLearn, a postgrad course. Um, we're exploring there the idea that students are studying. At the same time, we send them off to a MOOC, which we develop separately, and they partake in the MOOC, but also study their own participation in that MOOC. Um, we're a member of the OER University, which is a global consortium of universities who deliver, who uh, submit courses as OER, um, although I don't think we do as much with that as, as we might do, but they're exploring ideas such as uh, first year free, so you can study OER courses free for your first year, then go and get formal credit from uh, one or two institutions, and then move into formal study. A friend of mine in the US, so I hope to watch in, Robin DeRosa, I think has done a lot more interesting stuff with open pedagogy. So she teaches um, uh, early American literature, and she wasn't very happy with the textbook that she was recommending to her students. So she got some interns and paid them over the summer to create their own open textbook using this platform, Pressbooks. But then what she does is get her, her own students to come in and suggest amendments to that, to add new context, to add videos, or to try and find other examples and bring it up. I think what well, that's really interesting is that really it changes the nature of the relationship of a student between them and, and what knowledge is. You know, it's like, instead of it just being something you receive, it's something you partake with and can change and alter and construct going through a course. So then, again, this is an area that we might uh, explore further with the Open University. So I'm going to play uh, your vice chancellor for a year. Um, as well as, you know, concentrating on our core business, of satisfying our students, you can say, what would be the one area of the ones that I've listed that you say, you know, I'd like to, us to focus on that for this year, uh, to put resource into, to explore. So we've got MOOCs, OER, open educational practice, whether that's kind of through uh, individual scholars, open textbooks, open access publishing, uh, open pedagogy, or I'll allow you another. Let's see how those votes are coming in. I mean, say people who are watching online can vote as well. It doesn't have to be people here. I hope they've worked that out. Okay, so the clear winner seems to be open pedagogy, despite my trying to lead you down the uh, open textbooks path. But, you know, well done, for, well done for ignoring my lead. But I'm happy with open pedagogy too, so that's interesting. Uh, and I think you're right. That would be very good for us to explore. Good, thank you. Um, so having looked at the kind of the evolution of uh, what open education means, I now want to just turn to some kind of conceptualization of thinking about openness. So uh, working with Rob Farrows here and Dominic Orr, we conducted a project with the ICDE who were interested in what they called Open Online Flexible and Technology Enhanced Learning, which kind of had the acronym of UFAT, if you forget some letters. Um, and they were interested in what's actually going on around the globe with different universities, how they're employing online and open education. And they wanted to try and capture all the different practices, not just say that there's one model for this. So we came up with this kind of uh, conceptual model. Does this work? Okay. And we split kind of university functioning into three main components. So there's content, which is your stuff. That could be a lecture. It could be online material. There's how it's delivered. That could be face-to-face. -face, it could be blended. It could be online. And how it's recognised, how, how that learning is recognised. That could be you know, a challenge exam, a normal exam, projects, um, digital badges, those kind of things. <coughs> And for each of these, we said there were kind of roughly, there were two dimensions. How flexible you are. So, for example, can anyone access your content at any time, or is it kind of fixed? Uh, and how open you are. So who gets to access that content? And from this, we developed a, a, a rather lengthy questionnaire. Um, we asked people to kind of rate their own institution on these uh, nine axes. And we could then produce visualizations from those. So... Um, and from those visualizations, we can manage to pick out a number of different patterns. So I won't go through uh, all of them. 
that things like uh, content flex content delivery how flexible so that means uh, can stu can can learners access the content whenever they want uh, how op how open is it so who gets to access that content is it everybody so, uh, as in a MOOC or uh, only certain people how flexible is the support delivery so are there 24 hour um, help desks for instance uh, can you access your tutor anytime uh, how open is that who gets to deliver the support so that are there kind of forums for students to support people is the content personalized uh, and also elements around recognition so uh, is is recognition open can students bring in their learning from elsewhere uh, is it flexible so can they decide um, on what they want to be assessed when they want to be assessed those kind of things and we got people to kind of uh, rate their institution on that now it's a very subjective score so you know lots of people would have different things depending on where you sit but i ran this as a session at the ou and using the the same sort of voting function that we've had to use here. This is how people scored us, um, which I find it slightly surprising actually. You know, we are the open university, uh, so obviously we kind of scored very highly on content delivery. That's kind of our modus operandi. Students can access any time. People thought our delivery was quite open. Um, I think that's probably because of lots of lots of student forums, those kind of things. But we didn't score much uh, on, on the other axes, and I'll come back to that later. Uh, another project I worked on was called uh, Mapping Open Education, which, like all good projects, grew out of a conversation in, in a pub one night. Uh, so I was talking to uh, Owen de Vries, who's from Thompson Rivers University, and Viv Rolk here in the UK. And we were sort of bemoaning the fact that um, a lot of new things come along in open education, and they very rarely reference anything that's gone before. So um, MOOCs, for instance, never really talk about a lot of the fundamental research that went on in e-learning uh, and Viv had done some research that's shown that a lot of the early papers in the 70s written about places like the Open University were hardly ever referenced um, and so then working with an ex-PhD student of mine Katie Jordan who's a whiz at this stuff uh, we came up with um, well she came up with a, a method to explore this which was citation analysis so um, we did a library search for open education plus we um, recommended some key articles and from that she stripped out all the references and then found the references that those papers referenced and then the papers that those papers referenced. And from that, you get a kind of spreading activation network, which you can see. Oh, let me click it. Uh, okay, yeah, so you get a spreading activation network. So each blob is a, is a paper, and there's a line between them that shows it's being referenced. And the more it gets referenced, the kind of bigger the blob gets. So you begin to see these kind of these clusters emerging of different uh, areas. And plus, it's pretty. So. Um, you could see these clusters beginning to sort of come together. And then what we roughly ended up with was what we, so we put these categories on, but kind of eight areas then. So um, up in the top there is what we were mainly open access publishing. They often tended to be uh, information sciences, library science type publications. Uh, and down the bottom here is um, what you might call kind of traditional, distant said, so particularly stuff coming out in the 70s from places like the OU. Uh, this little cluster down here, Open Education Schools, there was a, a significant report published in the US in the 70s, and often that was about the kind of the layout of the classroom. Uh, E-learning then forms a kind of bridge between uh, that kind of traditional distance education and, and later developments. Uh, we've got social media over here, which is kind of social media use of uh, by academics, those kind of things. Uh, a lot of that coming from commu communication studies. Uh, but our kind of grumpy old people's musings were, were borne out, I think, by a lot of this. So you'll see that the MOOC papers over here don't really reference much over here and over here. They tend to operate in isolation. I think you see that with what you might call a kind of year zero mentality. Like, we've invented online learning this year. And, stuff. and even a lot of the OER stuff, I think, kind of sits alone. Um, and this in the middle here, kind of acting as a glue, you might, is what you might call open practices, kind of how academics use these kind of things. But I think there's a kind of opportunity for the open university, if you like, to, to act as, as the ring that binds all these things together, really. You know, we explore openness in all these different manners, all these different ways, and demonstrate how it's useful for academics and, and learners as a kind of powerful institution. So um, what all this led me to, to realise was that actually open is a really good name for a university. You know, it, it's not dated. You know, I think if you are starting at a, a university now if we didn't exist then calling it the open university would be a really good term you know, at the time we were often referred to as the university of the airwaves which i think would sound quite dated now uh, so, so we, we lucked out we got a really good name 
uh, which is good. Um, so that made me think, what might an OU invented today focus on? Uh, and one way of thinking about this is to um, return to the UFAP model. So I said this was kind of how we are now. Um, and that, that this was based on about sort of 30 or 40 people voting. And you might say, should the Open University be the kind of the, the pink line, perfect scores all the way around? You know, we should be openest, is kind of core to everything we do. Or is there an area we might want to focus on strategically and say, that's what we should develop next. That's our kind of core direction as, as an Open University. Uh, and you'll guess what's coming next. It's a poll. So you can tell me which aspect should the OU expand upon. So I only picked up some of them. So personalised content. So as students learn, they get recommended, say, open educational resources if they're struggling, maybe based on analytics or recommendation from others. Uh, open to further students. You know, a radical idea might be that all our course material is open. Um, use of open content in production. So using more OERs with great courses. Uh, bringing it in from elsewhere, recognising stuff. Uh, open recognition of assessment, so um, allowing students to bring in their learning from, say, Sailor or other places, these, or MOOCs, and say, we will recognise these this stuff. Uh, and flexible assessment, allowing students to say, uh, perhaps we do challenge exams, so you can just turn up and take an exam and we'll give you a credit, or that students can choose different bits of assessment, or they can drop out of a course halfway through and take some assessment with them and log it. So where are you coming down? Oh, okay. I didn't try to swing you on this one. I'll let you. It's a free vote. Okay, so the winner seems to be flexible assessment. Okay. I don't know what to do with that, but it's interesting. <laughs> <So> <laughs> I'll pass that on to someone else. That's probably your job, Liz. You can. <laughs> um, so as well as our, our core mission, I think uh, the role of the OU, uh, there are a couple of things I want to kind of pull out. Now one is to act as a, I think it's a useful body to have a national institution across all four nations that acts as a voice for part-time students. Um, even if they don't acknowledge it, lots of policymakers and politicians have a kind of conceptual model of the 18 to 22-year-old full-time student when and you can see how that influences lots of policies so um, the fee structure for example I think is a good example of that uh, Barbara and I both work on the TEF and a lot of the TEF is based around that kind of model and often we try to fight against it uh, and it's interesting a report came out in the in the US recently that 74% um, of students in, the, in US higher education are now non-traditional which kind of means I don't know what traditional means then if 74% are not traditional but they defined it as uh, either studying part-time, um, had a child of their own, uh, were older students. Or something. So they didn't fit that traditional uh, concept. But in the UK, the, the trend is the other way. So part-time study is falling, as we know, uh, and generally uh, older students are declining. That's probably a result of fees. And so I think it really helps to have a, a voice in the room, if you like, to, talk, to speak up for... Uh, part-time students and, and, and non-traditional students to kind of challenge that conceptual model. And I think the uh, OU and Wales is a good example of this. So when the, the Diamond Review was going on, uh, the OU fought very strongly to make sure that part-time students also got uh, maintenance grants. And so having them in the room was, was vital, I think. Um, another role, I think, uh, so I'm the president of the Association for Learning Technology and a shout out to Marin Deepwell, I think, is watching online, who's the CEO. Um, and at Alt, we developed um, a, a policy around openness because it wasn't just, it's not just that it's an interesting kind of byproduct or a peripheral interest. It's actually kind of core to how we relate to higher education. So you know, thanks to Brian Mathers who, for taking my quote and making it look intelligent. But I think if, if I was to give uh, any advice to the, the incoming vice chancellor, it would be to innovate around openness. If the OU innovates around what openness means in higher education, it will always stay current and, and relevant. And um, I think openness helps shape how our identity and also the identity of the higher education. So, um, near the end. So, um, I'd just like to get some input from you. So, for society, oh, complete this sentence. For society, open education is dot, dot, dot.
Someone's got him an apple. What's that one? I'm going to track that person down. It says, it says it's anonymous, but uh, <laughs> no, it, it is anonymous. Uh, no, I'm just, okay, thank you. So um, here are some of the ways I, I thought of ending that sentence. Practical, so uh, it's actually a very practical way to address a lot of the needs of a digital change in evolving society. Um, it's evolving, so it, it's not the thing that it was. It, it's changed over time, for, as I've tried to demonstrate. It's diverse. It's not just one definition of open education. That's a range of things. Uh, it's necessary, you're only going to meet the demands of certain students uh, and populations by having an open approach, uh, and we can't keep building new universities. It's useful for learners as they kind of go through their lives. A lot of them will need open education at some point. Perhaps they want to transition to a new job, upskill. Uh, it's innovative. I think you know that history that I, I drew out there, I think, shows a lot of the, the innovation, the interest in things in higher education happen around the notion of openness. Um, and it's the future, so I think that nearly all universities will at some point be engaging in some form of uh, open education. Uh, so my colleague uh, Rick Holliman and I, whose uh, inaugural is coming up next month, uh, worked on uh, a statement for the National Coordinating Centre for Public Engagement. Did I get that right, Rick? Um, and we want to kind of say what uh, um, our commitment to public engagement was. And we, we centred around, I can't remember who said which bit, but uh, openness should not just be a strategy or marketing employee, it's embodied in every aspect of the university. And at the Open University, we're always redefining what open means, which I think I'll try to demonstrate today. And our challenge to the wider education sector is to embrace those different interpretations and think about how they benefit society. So here, just to kind of sum up, um, this is my kind of very rough personal timeline. It's not necessarily the timeline of the Open University, and other people would have different ones. Um, but you kind of, so up until the 90s, we have the kind of traditional OU model, very successful. Uh, in 99, we, we take that large-scale e-learning approach and, and show that we can take the OU model and get it to work online. Develop um, an open VLE uh, in 2004. 2006, we start uh, with open educational resources and also start exploring open educational practice as uh, educators. Um, I took over Giant Brat here, but it had been going longer, but beginning to explore the idea of open access publications and their role. Exploring different MOOCs around from 2009. Uh, the idea of researching in the open, um, not just researching into open from 2012. And more recently, open textbooks and open pedagogy. I think if you look at that, that kind of tells quite a, a powerful narrative of innovation around the idea of, of openness. Um, and lots of interesting things happening there at the OU. So my kind of final point is, again, coming back to some of the stuff that happened last year in particular, um, the story we tell the world about ourselves isn't just a luxury. And I, I got that sense a lot last year. So um, Kurt Vonnegut says uh, we've become what we pretend to be. Uh, and I don't think we're pretending to be anything. So I think we need to make a better story about telling people what we are. And what we are is, as my American friend said, the open university. Thank you. Uh, and a friend of mine said, always leave people happy, so here's a picture of my dog. <laughs> I thank you all for coming out tonight. Okay, thank you. Thank you for that, Martin. I, I for one, really, really enjoyed it. So thank you very much. Um, now it's time to hear from you on any questions and comments that the talk has raised. So, Martin, we're going to go over to the seating area. Okay. Thank you. So we've got a roving, uh, roving mic, and we've also got people on, the, um, on, on laptops to uh, pick up um, comments from the online audience. So... Um, Please, if you have a question, can you introduce yourself, say who you are and where you're from, uh, and try to keep it short so that we can answer as many questions as possible. And if you're watching online, then please use the email provided on the slide showing to send in any questions. So, who's going first? Nick. Okay. Sorry. Uh, I'm Nick Braithwaite, Acting Executive Dean of STEM. 
Uh, Martin, thank you very much for that uh, talk. Uh, I really like the provocations that are in it, uh, and I'm all for the openness. But what's the business model? Because it seems to rest very heavily on people giving things away. Um, well, it depends which bit you're looking at. Um, so I think there are different models. So um, take open textbooks as an example, but we could pick other ones. Um, so you're right, open textbooks are based on giving stuff away and where's the business model in that. But I think if you look at it, you can kind of flip the economics of a lot of things. So at the moment, um, so Cable Green of Creative Commons, you know, we have a lot of money in, in, in education. We're just really bad at spending it. So at the moment, we pay a lot to publishers to buy material, which we then can't reuse what we want with. You could flip some of that money to then pay for the production of open content open textbooks, for instance, which are then free to use. And they've started to explore that model in, in the US. So I think there are different economic models based around openness that we can explore. Do you subscribe to uh, Wikipedia? Do, do I subscribe? I mean, do you, do you support them financially? Uh, no, I don't. Oh, interesting. <laughs> Um, I've got a question that's come in on live stream from Professor Alan Tate, who is Professor Emeritus of Hello Distance Alan. Education and Development. And he says, Hello, Martin. Is the institutional model of an open university under threat from the wide availability of online programs from other universities and colleges? Or is there something special and distinctive about the open university that mitigates that risk? So first of all, hello, Alan. Uh, thanks for coming. Um, it's a good question, and Alan and I have had this conversation at different places. I think there is, but I don't think it's guaranteed. So I, I tried to set out kind of a number of the roles, I think, for an open university, such as that being a voice of part-time students. But certainly, um, the arrival of the internet, so that from 95 onwards kind of timeline, um, meant that other universities could become more like the open university. And in some ways, it also allowed the open university to become more like other universities. So I think there is a kind of, there are a number of areas where having a large national institution it is viable. For instance, there are, there are courses that are kind of fairly small scale if you distribute them around, but if you, there's enough students nationally for them to make sense, if you like. And so I think exploring different models, such as, as we have done with the OU, um, allowing people to take kind of hybrid study to operate in, in, in collaboration with other universities where they may take one or two open universities courses but also study with them. So I think there are different ways we can explore that. But uh, it's right, it's not guaranteed and certainly the, the kind of monopoly we once had have, has gone. Kath Brown, President of the OU Students Association. Um, in all these aspects of open, all of which I think we can agree are admirable, um, do you think that open partnership working with students is integral to their success? And if not, why not? Hi, Kath. Uh, yeah, absolutely. I think, um, and a lot of that research we tried to do with the OER Hub was kind of trying to get that, that student voice in there and to find out how people are actually using these resources. Uh, and sometimes it's surprising they're not using them how you think they use them, and sometimes they're using them in much more ingenious ways <laughs> than you imagined. Um, but you really need to kind of understand that model. Uh, and I think often it's not just about asking, would you like this, but actually kind of seeing how it's actually used in practice. I think that there's a lot of that work to be done. Um, but I think you see that with MOOCs also. Uh, you know, I think a lot of the initial beliefs around MOOCs were, uh, you know, everyone's going to study them, they're going to democratise higher education. And then, of course, when we went to look at them, it was mainly privileged learners who already had uh, higher education. So if you want to work with learners, if you want to achieve those goals of MOOCs, then... Um, the support is the, the vital function in that, and that always involves working with students. Hi, Martin. Thanks for the wonderful presentation. I really enjoyed it. Uh, my name is Satish Krishnamurti. I'm professor in energy technology from School of A&I. So I liked your timeline, which you showed from uh, 1990s to this. So what is, your, what is your take on artificial intelligence in distance education? That's going to play a very key role because the employment is based on AI. Probably the whole jobs will be transformed. The jobs which is available now may not be available in the next few years because AI is going to kick off already. So I just wanted to have your comment. Uh, OK, 
Okay, th thanks for the AI question. I was hoping to get. <laughs> um, I have mixed feelings. I have mixed feelings about AI. I must, I'll confess, I did my PhD in AI, so, uh, um, and sometimes I kind of feel like it's the thing that's always just about to be there, but never actually is quite there. So, kind of a lot of the stories and promises we're seeing of AI were there back in in the 90s when I was doing my PhD. But I think you're quite right. Um, I guess um, my feeling in all this stuff is. I'm never very interested in technology that's trying to replace human educators. Because uh, I, I believe education is kind of fundamentally a, a human enterprise. But if AI can help people in that process, so I think, you know, and, and um, it, it, it would also mean, what do we mean by AI? Sometimes that kind of just be a statistical model. But I think some of the things we we're talking about maybe with personalized content, I, I don't think you want, for example, fully personalized co courses because there's something about that joint experience, but you might want some AI operating in the background that says, look, look, based on your analytics, you seem to be struggling with this concept over here. Here's a really useful um, you know, bit of OER that people who are struggling like you kind of found useful, and that's a kind of a really useful, helpful thing to, to do. So um, I'm cautiously for it, but not as kind of wrapped up as some of the kind of, some of, the kind of headlines, if that Onto the same trail, where do you fit in the low roadmap? Just an assumption, like <laughs> 2030, 2045. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because it's such a crazy thing. America is now currently working on um, what do you call um, road to immortality using AI. There is a company, startup company is there. <laughs> yeah. I'm not kidding. <laughs> yeah, so yeah. AI is going to play a role. Yeah, I think um, that's like it's. I could have put AI at any time prior to now in, in that timeline as well. It's like it's always just about to be in there, and I think we'll see cautious use of it. So when we did that uh, survey, I survey I mentioned, we kind of surveyed uh, institutions around the world, and hardly any of them are using AI, um, which I, I guess makes sense at the moment. But I think it will be for um, support for students, identifying issues. But, but uh, what I'm really worried about is the kind of black box algorithm that's, that begins to disenfranchise certain students. So like we decide We've got underneath this, this this lid. It says actually these students we don't want them, or they're they're more troubled than they're worth. And before you know it, you can't get into universities because the algorithm's deciding against you. So I'm always very cautious about the kind of blanket acceptance and the, and the kind of the need for the for an ethical and moral dimension to them. Does that make sense? Helen, I think we've got another question online. Uh, this one's come in from Twitter. Martin, from Dr. Jenny Heyman. Um, what aspect of openness do you believe contributes most to the life success, so personal life satisfaction, economic, other types of success of learners inside and outside of the OU? Okay, so Jenny's one of our fabulous GoGen uh, researchers that I mentioned. So hi, Jenny. Um, I think that that's, I probably can't give a single answer to that. It, uh, so for instance, um, I mentioned the course T171 that we did. That, mar that passed its 20th anniversary recently, and someone I know from those days is on Facebook, and she posted, oh, 20 years since T171 started, and loads of people who follow us are like, that course completely changed my life, you know, from there I went on to do so many different things. And that was, although it was kind of online, it wasn't open in the sense of anyone could study, it wasn't open like a MOOC is open. But for those people, that form of openness was the most dramatic and most significant for them. Um, and I think for lots of people it's just it's coming to believe that you can you can become a learner I think particularly the sorts of students we often get with the open university um, often have a doubt about whether education is for them and whether and however they come to it whether that's through a formal OU course whether it's through one of our openings courses or MOOCs or OER it's about kind of that shift in identity for I'm not sure this is for me to I can do this, I, I am a learner, I can, I can engage in it. So where, however they, they kind of come to that realization, I think is the significant part. Hello. We've got questions coming in from all over the world. Um, this one is from Mariella Beringen, who's from the Netherlands. She's an MA ODE student. So what can MA ODE students do to promote OEP, open educational pedagogy, at their own college, university, especially the more traditional ones. 
Okay. Uh, <laughs> I think it is always difficult because um, students, and I, I don't mean this as a criticism, I think um, I was the same. Um, students are often quite conservative when they come in to study. They kind of have an idea about what higher education should be like. Um, and so if you start trying to tweak that too much, it doesn't match the, the model they have. So I think if you, so you always need to kind of justify why you're, why you're doing this. Um, but I think for certain subjects, particularly as you get sort of further up the, the higher educational ladder, it's a good way to kind of explore um, particularly complex topics. So things like use of an open textbook and getting people to construct that textbook themselves or take it apart or, um, or add new pieces to it. It begins to change the way that they, they perceive of, of, of knowledge and, and their role within it and, and work collaboratively with others to do that. I think we've got time for just one well more. I've got, I've got two people in the room okay. waiting, so could you pass that back? Yeah. Helen, just behind you, and then we'll take the last one from yeah. Sandra after that. Thank you. Uh, Martin Lavoy, um, retired lecturer at Open University. Um, there's a second word in the Open University that you've only touched on. Uh, so my question is around, in the 21st century, is the bachelor degree past its sell-by date? And should we, when is it really sensible for 50% or more of our population being aiming for this rather perhaps outdated concept in terms of uh, qualifications and uh, the future of society? I thought the other word you were going to go for was the. I could, I could have gone with that. <laughs> <laughs> so we'll go with the, go, we'll go with the university. Uh, it's, a, it's an interesting question, uh, and, it's, you know, just, and it's much like the lecture, despite all the proclamations of its death, it kind of keeps going on. Um, and I've just been writing a book, uh, which I hope will be the, the third open access one, about 25 years of ed tech. And one of the things I was looking at there was uh, e-portfolios. Um, and this whole idea of kind of accrediting small chunks of learning. And it makes kind of perfect sense. But they still don't always take off, partly because um, it's not so much to do with the technology. It's about kind of society's recognition and uh, acceptance of those things. So... If you ask employers, um, do you want an e-portfolio with all this kind of listing of everyone's credentials and all the, all the things they've achieved, they say, yeah. But then when they get like, you know, 50 applicants with these massive e-portfolios actually go, oh, do you know what, who's got a degree? Uh, that's right. And so it does kind of provide a kind of cultural shorthand, I think. So I mean, it's, I mean, in many ways you could say, oh no, of course it's all gonna be informal accreditation, digital badges, e-portfolios, small chunks of learning, put together on the blockchain, you know, that, that's what it's going to look like. But I wouldn't mind betting in 10 years' time it looks pretty similar to what it does now. You know, so I think these things kind of have a, a momentum and an inertia which is almost of their own, you know, which is regardless of whether they're, they're always the best solution. So I think we, we'll have to ask um, Martin to come back to deliver another lecture on that topic. But um, Sandra, last question from you. Hi, uh, Sandra Summers. I'm a student currently in FBL. Um, y you've touched on it, and there's lots of good stuff going on. Um, but have you done any research in what I'll call student resistance to the technologies? Uh, and uh, Cass laughing, but, you know, uh, print. <laughs> I'll just leave it there. It, 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 have you actually researched the resistance to changing to the technologies? Yeah, yeah and I think... Um I'll be honest, I think when I was early to this stuff, when I was um, you know, back in the, the e-learning is the way forward days, I was a real kind of advocate and like, why can't these students just accept that what I'm doing is right, <laughs> you know, that, that kind of attitude. But I've changed since then and I think I, I, I've come to understand the, a lot of those nuances and I think, uh, you know, you mentioned print, I think people have a real kind of, uh, I don't mean this in a blink, but people have a real kind of emotional attachment to, to physical books, to books themselves. Uh, and I think that actually plays a really important part in education. And I don't want to remove that. So I think, for instance, things like um, when we were doing the open textbook project, the most influential factor trying to convince academics that they're a good idea was that we worked with um, this company uh, US in, in the US called OpenStax. And they produce really nice open textbooks. You only got to put one of those in someone's hand and they go, Oh, I get it. This is good stuff. You know, there is that kind of emotional attachment and response to a book. So um, I think what's often what we often think of as, as resistance is actually kind of 
coming from a different place that we need to, to understand. Um, I mean, I think sometimes, you know, we're, we're all creatures of habit, you know, it's like, and you kind of, I, I, I know I like this, I'm not sure I'll, I'll like this, and um, sometimes you have to kind of just keep pushing those things forward, because if we want to project and be a modern university, we, don't, we wouldn't still be doing what we were doing in the 70s, but I think there's often something very real to be got out of with what we just think of as resistance, so I hope that's a, an answer. I'm afraid that's all uh, the questions we've got time for. Um, I just would like to thank Martin for, um, for a really interesting, excellent lecture and for provoking such a lot of thoughts and ideas and questions, and I think there's a lot that we could follow up on in discussion. Thank you very much.